Next up on the Cosmic News Network, first contact with Joshua Pert. Good morning, Earthlings. Good. How you doing today? Good. How you doing today? Welcome to First Contact Radio. Welcome to First Contact Radio. To talk about all these things I'm talking about is because in life, everything is energy. Every single thing that's out there. Yo, it's First Contact with Joshua Pert. He's a man on the mic, just in case you didn't know it. Covering news from all around the globe, from the weather and space. Good morning, Earthlings. How you doing today? Welcome to First Contact Radio. We've made it to Friday. Moving right along. All right, today's the 24th. So what we're looking at today is a sun sign is in Aquarius. A moon sign is in Scorpio. Aquarius is an air sign. Scorpio is a water sign. So as we go into the world today, the two elements we're dealing with are air and water. Now, why is this important? The idea, again, just to um, reiterate, is to be able to understand that every day when we wake up and move in the world, we're moving in a field of energy. And if we understand what that field of energy is, then it helps us to move around in it a little bit more effectively. And as we learn to balance the field of energy that we are, then when we're walking around it, it even makes it more um, harmonious for us. So the whole idea is for us to learn about how to understand this energy field that's around us. And astrology helps us to do that because planet Earth has all of the planets and the stars around it that affect the Earth energetically because of the different vibrations each one of the planets provides and how those vibrations affect the individuals down here on Earth. So by understanding on a daily basis the major lights of the sun and the moon, it helps us to get a, a good overall view of what's going on for the day energetically. There's ways you can get more detail oriented, but you just need an overall view. The sun represents the conscious mind, the moon, the unconscious mind. The unconscious mind is what is under the surface of the conscious mind. When you go to sleep at night and you have dreams, that's happening in your unconscious mind. When you meditate, you're accessing your unconscious mind. Um, that's where we go to be able to visualize or create that which we want to bring into the conscious world. Because everything is about energy, and energy moves at different rates of speed. And what we're, what we're learning how to do is to take energy, spirit, fire, water, air, and bring it down into earth. So it's just all about finding practical ways to make all this work for us. So today we have conscious mind, that which is experienced in the outside world. What we're consciously thinking about, the issue we're dealing with, is the issue of air, Aquarius. So as we go into the world today practical way to make use of this is to know that there's this Aquarian energy out there this there's this idea of looking towards the future people are optimistic and hopeful about wanting to have good things go on and then we look at the subconscious mind Scorpio which is a water sign and it's a water sign that really has a lot of implications of things being buried down deep emotions buried deep so in the midst of all of this thought about wanting to look to the future and see the brightness and the hopefulness of things we also have all of these emotions coming up under the surface and when they do all those emotions and the mental aspect of the air they kind of are at odds with each other things are a little bit unsettled and so in order to focus the mind one really has to be disciplined because the emotions are there under the surface just kind of pushing at things, wanting to get through. And so that's sort of the challenge that we have with this particular energy. But with all challenges, we simply learn how to move through it because this energy affects us every day. We have energy around us. So it's not like we get it right or wrong. We just learn more and more how to do it, like surfing on, a, on the waves. You stand up, you get on the board, the better you get, the better you get, or anything in life. So we're dealing with air. For the mind, 
water for the unconscious mind. Air is words and actions, I thoughts, ideas. Water is emotions, feelings. Uh, in a little bit, we have a triangle, which is a trine. Nice harmonious aspect between the energies, and that's between Mercury right here, which is communication, and Mars, which is about action. So Mars represents action, but if action is stifled, it becomes frustrating. So the whole idea is to make sure that one takes their action, charges forward with what it is they want to communicate. Okay, and find the passion about what you're expressing in there. Later on, we have a triangle here between Jupiter and the Moon, which is Scorpio. So Scorpio and Jupiter will be in a trine. So we have the emotions of the Scorpio and the expansiveness of Jupiter. So Jupiter expands things, and then we have these emotions that are there in this realm, this energy field which has been expanded, and it allows us an opportunity to explore more of what those emotions are about. So if you find yourself in, in a place of uh, high emotions this afternoon, don't be surprised. Par for the course. All right, so those are the main things we're looking at. We just look for the triangles and the squares. And uh, that's it. So that's what's going on today. Air and water. Okay, our thoughts, our words, and our actions, and our uh, emotions. The sky for today it says mercury has become easy to see look for it low in the west southwest as twilight fades don't confuse it with twinkly formal hot off to its left in the southwest mercury is beginning its best evening apparition since last june for the mid northwest northern sky watchers the moon rises around 2 a.m. saturday morning the 25th with saturn Glowing just one degree or two degrees from it. They're high in the southern together by dawn, in the south together by dawn, as shown here. So here's our sunrise tomorrow, what we're going to see when we wake up in the morning. Out in Scorpio, Scorpius. If you have an app on your phone, you can check it out when you go outside, one of the sky maps. All right. And this is where we're going to see, well, this was yesterday's. All right, moving on. The moon phase today is we're at the third quarter, making our way down to the new moon. So it's getting less and less, which means it's waning, waxing up, waning off, waning down. 45% to go before we get to the new moon. Now here in the Mayan Oracle, today's a galactic tone, which is called the galactic tone of integrity. Kin for today is the world bridger, teaches us the lessons of life and death, and the guide to the, for today is the dog, which is all about the heart, loyalty, love. So today would be called the galactic world bridger, guided by the dog. You could see our position here in this wave spell as we move along with the theme of the storm, gathering the energy. So we've gathered the energy. And we've had the enlightenment of understanding the separation of the energy. We've given new birth to it, communicated it, used our subconscious to decide how we want to use it, plant the seed, allow the energy to build up. And today we're learning the process that happens when something goes from that idea phase to the next phase. It goes through this period of death where we're uncertain what's going to happen. And then suddenly new life springs forth. And then the hand is about accomplishment. Okay? Phrase for today is I harmonize in order to equalize modeling opportunity. I seal the store of death with the galactic tone of integrity. I am guided by the power of heart. If we look at the Zulkin on the long count, today would be a 13 Kawak, is the name of today. And on the Hob, today would be a 17 Amuan. So. Just a little bit different calibrations, but it's all basically the same idea, looking and working to understand the energy. All right, space weather, solar wind, 395.4 kilometers per second. Planetary K index, we're in the quiet range, 1 to 3. 
M class flares 15%, X class 1. So things have dropped. This was up to 30, not what, just the other day, right? And geomagnetic storm activity is way down. We were in the 25s here, so things have really subsided out there in the cosmos. We can look here over at the NOAA's Space Weather Prediction Center just to double check everything. Alright, so let's see where our wind is at. Just shy of 400. There's a it's always good to have some comparisons to check just because it's always good to confirm. And then again, let's if we want to take a look at the sun right now. Pick one of these for today. Let's look at the last go to. There you have it. Very exciting, right? And that's it. That's uh, that's all the whole wrap up of what's going on out there with the energy around us. UFO news is next. This is the UFO news with Joshua Poet. All right, Dirk. Thank you very much. You know you hear his voice every day, but you really haven't seen his face too much, Dirk Bradshaw. But uh, you'll be seeing more of Dirk. He's going to be doing some new episodes, and uh, you shall be seeing the face that goes along with that voice. All right, UFO news. Here we have a story, amazing UFO near space station. This was January 2014. All right. There's an image there. Street Cap 1 of YouTube recorded this UFO near the ISS this week and has a light that is coming down against the outer wall of the ISS. Amazing catch and just goes to prove you've tried to catch a UFO on live cam at the ISS. You will succeed sooner or later. This is a pretty good shot here. Definitely. The 125 is the length of this video clip. And again, this is Street Cap 1. He catches a lot of video. You yourself can watch. There we go. We have our object right here. And all you have to do is tune into the channel and watch. And if you tune in and you watch the NASA channel, you'll see things. All right. That was very interesting. Okay, so we definitely have an object out there with some sort of what appears to be light shining from one direction or the other. All right, pretty fascinating. How'd you like to be out there in the ISS at this point in time? And you look out, and there's another. Uh, ship out there. Okay, next up, UFO sightings FAA will not confirm. FAA, Federal Aviation Administration, and it says, once again, there are persons swearing that they've seen some unidentified flying objects in the sky, according to ABC News on Friday. The reports by persons have actually been going on for several days. It wasn't until Friday that there have been an there has been an official response to the numerous reports that have come in. In spite of the assertions by people who say they witnessed the objects flying through the sky, authorities at the federal level said, the, said on Friday there has been absolutely no unusual flights activity in California. The witnesses claimed they saw strange lights in the sky in the morning of January 1st of the new year. The witnesses have made their reports from various cities in the state as well. A witness in Stockton said she saw six bright orange colored lights, which were in the diamond or triangle shape. Then the witness asserted the objects started separating. Similar reports were made by persons in such cities as Sacramento. Some reports varied somewhat from the description of the shining light, however. Yet a spokesperson for the Federal Aviation Administration, Ian Gregor, maintained on Friday that there was no unusual flight activity reported Tuesday night. All right, so there's report number one. 
Here we go again. Uh, multiple realities of the men in black. Nick Redfern has done quite a bit of research on the subject of the men in black. If there is only one thing we can say with any certainty about the infamous events that occurred outside Roswell, New Mexico in the summer of 1947, it's that there are multiple theories for what happened, and no one can offer any real hard evidence that definitively nails things one way or the other. Of course, ufology have always been like that, but Roswell seems to typify the aspect of the UFO phenomena like no other case. The many and varied scenarios involved a crashed UFO, a fallen weather balloon, a mogul balloon used in the detection of the Soviet atomic bomb tests, an experiment based around high-altitude balloons and Japanese people, some sort of atomic mishap, a Soviet ruse involving mutilated kids, crash test dummies, a flying wing experiment, a craft cl flown by time travelers from our future, a vehicle created by an ancient terrestrial race that lives deep underground in the vast caverns, and even a demonic Trojan horse-style deception. But of the thing that we can be sure, clearly all of the above shows scenarios cannot be correct. But hang on a minute or several. Just maybe they can all be correct after all. Welcome to the complex world of multiple timelines, alternate realities, and multi-dimensions. Now before I get back, get taken to task, as I'm sure, as someone will surely do, I'm not saying at all that what I'm about to discuss definitively explains Roswell only that it's something worth musing upon and speculating on and that's it there's nothing wrong with wild theorizing and if you have a problem with wild theories tell it to someone who actually cares not to me consider this what makes Roswell so confusing is that so many of the theories have actually degrees of merit attached to them the original comments of Max Brazel who found the huge debris field on the Foster Ranch do seem to suggest like a weather balloon came down and when one takes a careful read of the Air Force 1994 Mogul Balloon Report, some, but certainly not all, of the data does resonate with the Mogul scenario. On the other hand, the so-called memory metal strewn across the ranch does not accord with the balloon debris in the slightest. It does indeed suggest something unearthly was in our midst. Then there's the matter of the bodies. Let's start with the crash test dummy scenario. Although many Roswell researchers dismiss this theory, both Gerald Anderson and Jim Ragsdale described seeing dummy-like bodies. As for the Japanese theory, Melvin Brown, a witness to the strange corpses, told his family that the body seesaw could have passed for Chinese. We have others who claim diminutive gray-like aliens were recovered on the ranch. Others talk of far more human-looking aliens, somewhere around five feet in height. As for the crash site itself, we hear of debris field and nothing else. Others, however, claim a definitive flying saucer was found somewhere in the area, or was it a semi-intact saucer? Some say neither, and said it was an escape pod, or a German Horton aircraft, or a mistakenly dropped atomic bomb. How is it feasible so many people could have so many conflicting stories of what they saw, knew, or heard? The most obvious answer is that the multiple scenarios and storylines have been officially created over the years to deliberate create confusion over what really happened and that may very well be the crux of it and nothing else but let's indulge ourselves for a while into the multi timeline and multiple reality theories to do so we have to address the thought-provoking words of a friend of mine Joshua P Warren all right and if we continue on there's more here but I'm gonna leave it for you to continue next up here uh, question is asked why do you believe extraterrestrials are visiting earth it's a very fair and valid question for mankind's benefit to cure disease and starvation and to give us advanced technologies well there really isn't much more to it than that here just the question and then there's the poll doing the uh, refresh make sure I didn't miss anything yet it's basically it so if you want to put your opinion here on this poll that is over at UFO digest and just go to the link it's at firstcontactradio.com for today and post your answer 
see what uh, see what others are saying about it. All right, they just put the poll up there. Well, it says uh, this week it was put up there. We've got some responses, and uh, there you go. Okay, one more piece. This one is you've seen part of this before. This was the uh, sent by Eisenhower to meet an alien. Amazing confession of ex-military. Says the interview was displayed as part of a citizen hearing held April 30th, uh, May through May 3rd, 2013, about ET disclosure. The hearing was held in Washington in front of six former U.S. congressmen and congresswomen, as well as U.S. senator. This is the confession here. The whole piece is 17 minutes. I'm just going to play the opening segment so you understand again who and what this is about and then uh, we'll let it go from there there we go this was from March 5th 2013 yes well as we get older and older I'm 77 right now you can't live forever you know so if this uh, um, procedure I mean, going to have to clean the blood doesn't work, then I've got probably a few more months to make it before my kidneys shut down, you know. So that's kind of why I'm kind of going along with the interview at this time. You're seeing that what you went through is just too important for people not to know about. Yeah. Yeah. Can you just, let? can we start at the beginning with your military career and just walk through what exactly your experiences were? I was in the, drafted into the military and got into the U.S. Army. After that, I was sent to the Signal Training Center in eastern United States. What year would this be? 58. I went through the signal training course, and at that time, I went through the radio teletype course, and also the cryptography course, crypto. They had five instructors that were getting out of military service, so they pulled the top five students, and I was third in the class. So I got pulled as an instructor. Now, were you at this time also working yet for CIA? No. Not yet? No. After one day, my boss came to me, and he uh, said, how would you like to, you know, make some extra money? And I said, oh, money is good. <laughs> <laughs> so he explained to me that I could... He could put it through, I would have to get a top secret White House Q clearance for the job, you know. And I thought, boy, must be a pretty exclusive thing, you know. And I said, well, what is this? And he said that I'm director for the CIA for Eastern United States, you know. And I said, oh, I didn't know that. And he said, you weren't supposed to. <laughs> <laughs> After about six weeks, my security clearance came through, and I got my CIA card. It was an ID card, like a credit card, where I could just go up to the door and slice it, walk right in. And my uh, name at that time, I used an mm -hmm. artificial name, too. Never used my real name. All right, so you can see where it's kind of going from there. Pretty interesting. Very interesting. It's uh, 17 minutes, but there you got a link, so you have something cool to watch. All right, I'm going to jump away. I'll be back. I have some more stories, so stay tuned. Come into our circle, great spirit. Fill our souls with peace. Send down your love, send down your love. 
was great spirit. One of these days I gotta make a video to that song. I will. Alright, alright, where'd it go from here? Alright, uh, this story, Seven Theories on the Origin of Life. We always wonder about life, so these are some really interesting theories here. Life on Earth began more than three billion years ago, evolving from the most basic of microbes into a dazzling array of complexity over time. But how did the first organisms on the only known home to, li to life in the universe develop from the primordial soup? Here are science's seven theories on the origin of life. First one, DNA. Nowadays, uh-oh, there we go. Nowadays, DNA needs protein in order to form, and proteins require DNA to form. So how could these have formed without each other? The answer may be RNA, which sometimes can store information, which can store information like DNA, serves as an enzyme like proteins, and help create DNA and proteins. Later, DNA and proteins succeeded this RNA world because they are more efficient. RNA still exists and performs several functions in organisms, including acting as an on-off switch for some genes. The question still remains how our RNA got here in the first place, and while some scientists think the molecule could have spontaneously arisen to Earth, others say it was very unlikely to have happened. Other nucleic, nucleic acids other than RNA have been suggested as well, such as the more serious, more esoteric PNA or TNA. Here we have another one, molecules meeting clay. The first molecules of life might have met on clay, according to an idea elaborated by organic chemist, chemist Alexander Graham Cairn Smith at the University of Glasgow in Scotland. These surfaces might not only have concentrated these organic compounds together, but also help organize them into patterns, much like our genes do now. The main role of DNA is to store information on how other molecules should be arranged. Genetic sequences in DNA are essentially instructions on how amino acids should be arranged in proteins. Karen Smith suggests that the mineral crystals in clay could have arranged organic molecules into organized patterns. After a while, organic mo molecules took over this job and organized themselves. Okay, that's a good one. Then we have the deep sea vent theory. It suggests that life may have begun at the submarine hypo hydrothermal vents, spewing key hydrogen-rich molecules. The rocking nooks could have concentrated these molecules together and provided mineral catalysts for critical reactions. Even now, these vents, rich in chemical and thermal energy, sustain vibrant ecosystems. Ice may have been considered, may have covered the oceans three billion years ago, as the sun was about to about a third less luminous than it is now. This layer of ice, possibly hundreds of feet thick, might have protected fragile organic compounds in the water below from ultraviolet light and destruction from cosmic impacts. The cold might also have helped these molecules to survive longer, allowing key reactions to happen. RNA. Instead of developing from complex molecules such as RNA, life might have begun with small molecules interacting with each other in cycles of reactions. These might have been contained in simple capsules akin to cell membranes, and over time, more complex molecules that performed these reactions better than the smaller ones could have evolved scenarios dubbed metabolism-first models as opposed to the gene-first model of the RNA world hypothesis. And then panspermia. Perhaps life did not begin on Earth at all, but was brought here from elsewhere in space, a notion known as panspermia. For instance, rocks regularly blasted off Mars by cosmic impacts, and a number of Martian meteorites have been found on Earth that some researchers have conversely suggested brought molecules over here, microbes over here, potentially making us all Martians originally. Other scientists have even suggested that life might have hitchhiked on comets from other star systems. However, even if this concept were true, the question of how life began on Earth would then only change to how life began elsewhere in space. And last, electricity. Electric sparks can generate amino acids and sugars from the atmosphere loaded with water, methane, ammonia, and hydrogen, as was shown in the famous miller ure experiment reported in 1953, suggesting that lightning might have helped cre cre 
create the key building blocks of life on Earth in its early days. Over millions of years, larger and more complex molecules could form. Although research since has revealed the early atmosphere of the Earth was actually hydrogen poor, scientists have suggested that volcanic clouds in the early atmosphere might have held methane, ammonia, and hydrogen and been filled with lightning as well. So there's seven theories, electricity, panspermia, RNA, ice, deep sea vents, molecules meeting clay, and DNA. How did life begin? Well, that's the question. So there's the information, so you can check it out. This article here about martial arts, but more of the spiritual aspect of martial arts. Robert James Baratti. Uh, he wrote this. He who wishes to live in an oriental martial art rather than just to practice it on the physical level must so train his consciousness to attain a self-discipline that at last his conscious mind will merge into an identity with the very principle of life itself. Quote Maurice Zale. Amongst the unusual loud and predictable offerings at the Australian cinema box office last summer, the Hollywood movie The Last Samurai emerged as an interesting alternate form for many curious moviegoers. We were presented with a unique perspective on the cultural interaction between East and West. The film deals most exclusively with the philosophical, spiritual, and martial differences between Japan and America, and presents in grand form the figure of the samurai, by the way his met martial practice has powerful spiritual dimensions to which the West cannot relate. The traditional practice of martial arts is now experiencing a renaissance of sorts, and this largely due to the fact that many people are realizing the existence of the esoteric spiritual components behind the widely known styles. The arts are no longer considered remnants of old cultures, but valid and effective methods of achieving spiritual growth. The martial arts were accumulated, actually formulated for this purpose all along. In 475, the Indian monk Bodhahama arrived in southern China. On his arrival, he moved to the Huan province, where he spent nine years in meditation, facing the rock wall of a cave. When the monk emerged from his retreat, he stumbled across a small mountain temple approximately one mile called Shol Sholin. Bodhidharma was shocked to see the terrible physical condition of the monks of the Sholin Temple who practice long-term meditation exercises which while making them spiritually strong totally destroyed their physical bodies. Bodhidharma created an exercise regime for the monks involving physical techniques that were efficient in strengthening the body and eventually could be used to defend oneself from the inevitable traveling thieves and gangs prominent in the area that time. The later benefit was a simple side benefit of the practice. The former was the main objective. The primary concern was always maintaining the physical strength of the monks for the purpose of the meditation. These physical exercises developed into what we now know as the martial arts. So, very interesting that how it evolved from a spiritual ideal. So there again is the foundation. Like everything else, we want to look what came before so we can begin to understand it a little better. All right, so let me move on from here. What I want to read for you, I got a poem. I have a poem here. A friend of mine, Kevin Drinkwater, amazing poet um, he passed several years back crossed over but beforehand he had written this book about of poetry called the guide for the spiritual astronaut and so today I just thought I'd read a couple of his poems that is it so this first one is called on the scale of the big picture. Looking on the scale of the big picture, everything seems real clear. No more misery, death, or destruction. No more worry, the end is near. For this world is part of a cycle where everything has its time, and balance is the harmony of the eternal conscious mind. 
where mankind is but an actor in the play of eternity, and once his role is over, his spirit will set free. Our Mother Earth will survive if we destroy our atmosphere, for once it, it and we are gone, a new one will appear. For it's all part of the energy of the eternal conscious mind, which comes as galaxies, planets, and stars, and tools named mankind. So if you're feeling sad for our Earth, just looking down from a great height, for on the scale of the big picture, everything will be all right. Let me do another one for you here. This one is called The Bard. The Bard. The Bard has come, the season is set, the sun empowers the sky. You yourself, the looking gas, glass, the light you will magnify. For all to see, the knowledge unwrapped answers the question why. Mankind walks with tattered wings, disabling him to fly. And one last piece here is called The Way of the Universe. Out there, above the clouds, I spend my time, carried by the winds of joy, searching and feeling for the truth, for I am an observer and a messenger, flying around shut doors, and through new door gateways I see open, never trying to open a locked door that is just slammed shut, for it's shut for a reason. For as the whole of creation is the pulsing energy of the eternal conscious mind, forever moving in circular motion, as one door shuts, another must open, for this is the way of the universe, and through that open door lies the pathway to your dreams. So there you go. Poetry of Kevin Drinkwater, though he is not here, his words live on. And... Uh, good stuff, Kevin. Good stuff. I know you're still out there. All right, all right, um, let me jump over to a song, and then I'm going to come back. This is Observation. Another alien visitor claimed that his race had been looking in on us for centuries, and that they had, in fact, influenced the course of human history in some rather critical and startling ways. Listen up. Yeah. 
that's my report. Don't arouse the suspicion of a membrane gone insane. Everything is possible. Just gotta see with an open mind. observation it's off our first album and I and the others Ufoetry we are in the uh, preparations of a second album so we'll have that sometime later this year and of course with an album comes live performances so when that all comes about you'll be the first to know all right this article here it's called proof that the pineal gland is literally a third eye is it possible that you literally have a third eye that connects you to spiritual dimensions? The pineal gland is something that is spoken of in the New Age community as being the intuition organ and the connection point between body and spirit, but very few people realize that the pineal gland is in fact a literal eye. The pineal gland is a pea-sized gland in the exact geometric center of the brain and comes from the root word pinea, which is Latin for pine cone. Pinecone symbolism appears all over the ancient world from the Sumerian, Greek, and Roman traditions to the Vatican court of the pine cone and the staff of the Pope. It is highly revered. Where's the X here? There it is. It is highly revered to be of psychic and spiritual significance, and the and binds are often word in Hindu culture as a way of signifying the pineal gland's importance in spiritual wakefulness. Why are so many ancient cultures obsessed with the pineal gland symbolism? The answer may be found when biophysical analysis is done of the pineal gland. Under the skin of the skull is a, of a lizard lies a light responsive third eye, which is the evolutionary equivalent of the bone encased hormone secreting pineal gland in the human brain. The human pineal is denied access to light directly, but like the lizard's third eye, it shows enhanced release of its hormone melatonin during the night. The challenge is to the understand the mechanisms which regulate the synthesis and release the melatonin. The pineal gland is the mind's eye. Dissected, the reptilian's pineal gland looks much like an eye with the same shape in the tissue. This was Dr. Cheryl Kraft, Ph.D. Chair of the Department of Cell and Neurobiology, the University of Southern California. What's fascinating is that the interior of the pineal gland actually has retinal tissue composed of rods and cones, photoreceptors inside interior lining just like the eye, and is even wired into the visual cortex of the brain. The photoreceptors of the retina strongly resemble the cells of the pineal gland. Dr. David Klein, Science Daily. It even has vitreous fluid in in it like an eye does. This was an article from Science News. The retina and the pineal gland are organs primarily responsible for the body's recognition and sophisticated processing of eternal light, external light. Until recently these two organs in mammals seemed to have little ease in common and were consequently studied by separate groups of scientists. But a new alliance of researchers is now exploring striking similarities that are speeding research efforts in both fields. Their findings suggest that the pineal gland was the evolutionary precursor to the modern eye, while it turned out that the rhythm, retinal rhythm is independent of the pineal gland. Once the groups of scientists began working together, they discovered surprising similarities between the two organs, including the presence of photoreceptors. So pretty cool. So there's certainly more to the article. Check out the link, and uh, you'll be able to uh, read the rest of it there. Let's jump over to our video here. This is message from the High Council of Orion. Here we go. Light of the World Part Two. Channel dissension message from the High Council of Orion. January seventeenth. 2014, channeled by Holly Hawkins Marwood. 
Transcribed by Paul Marwood. The Council. Greetings, dear ones. We are the High Council of Orion. How do you feel about living into your reality that you are the light of the world? As we shared in our last message to each and every one of you who listen, the truth that you are the light of the world and we encourage each and every one of you to connect into that space of your heart to begin to feel that. We invite you again today to not set aside the idea of that message that you are the light of the world, but continue on with it to explore it at an even deeper level. For as you spend time with this and begin to experience your connection with your light in your quiet moments of meditation or alone time, regrouping time, you begin to live into it as a reality so it's not just a thought in your mind or a channeling that you read, but you begin to work with the experience that you are the light of the world. We would encourage each and every one of you to spend those few moments every day connecting in with your center, connecting with your heart and your solar plexus energy. Allow yourself to ground those energies back down into the planet. Allow the energies to flow upward and out and into connection with the universe, with all that is, with the energy of your source. Allow the flow of the universal energies and the planetary energies to flow back into your heart and your solar plexus area and mingle and move in those two centers for you. The way we see those energies flowing between your solar plexus and your heart is as if it's in the infinity symbol. So if you begin at your solar plexus and the energies rise up to the heart area and then move back down in that figure 8 that's vertical. Just feel the movement of those centering energies for you. As you feel the motion and the movement and see the light allow the light to expand out into your physical body. Literally, see it infusing itself into each cell, in each organ, all the tissues and the fluids in your body. Really take the time to feel and live into your awareness of the infusion of light throughout your physical body. Then, in the way that you choose to view it, see the light begin to infuse itself into the energetic bodies, the subtle energy bodies, the ones that also the go out beyond the boundaries of your physical body. Just feel yourself living into that light. Allow your breathing to flow in and out as you do for your breathing allows that connection to source. As you feel your connection with your light body and your light being, allow the thoughts of your mind to just dissolve away into the space of your heart and your solar plexus. Just feel the light. Feel the expansion. As you connect with yourself on this level of light and energy see that energy expanding outward. See it mingle, dance and intertwine with the light of those around you, the other humans, the animals, the plants, the buildings. For at its essence all the substances are the same. They all are made of the same light energy. Observe how you feel. Observe the inflow of peace, of settledness, centeredness. This is about moving into this place of now also. As you live into the space of your light experience, when you feel peaceful and centered, you can ask for guidance. Ask for inspiration. Ask for understanding about any area of your life that isn't flowing with the light that you are feeling at the moment. Work to ask those questions from your heart and from your solar plexus instead of your mind. Just allow your light to flow into it. Allow your life to unfold, for it's a time now of moving away from information and more into this feeling and this experience of yourself as a light being. It would be our wish for you to grow and live into the understanding and the truth of you being the light of the world so that you can utter those words past your lips from a place of truth and knowingness. Your ego might want to say it's ego-based to say that you are the light of the world, but as you connect with it, in its truth, as you spend more time with it, you will be able to think and see and feel and even say that you are the light of the world. The light within you is the light that you've been seeking. The light within you is the light that contains all the answers and all the solutions. It's all within you and it's all within your reach. It's all within your field of possibilities. We encourage each and every one of you to play in the light field as the light being that you are. Joyfully embrace the truth that you are the light of the world. Be blessed. We are the High Council of Orion. Alright, very nice. I think we might have heard that one the other day, but it's well worth hearing again absolutely so we will focus on the light of the world during our meditation today all right here's our affirmation every day in every way i'm free freely opening my senses to the beauty in myself and opening up to the beauty around me and all the people i will encounter
All right. So go ahead and close your eyes. Take a deep breath. And exhale. Take another deep breath. And exhale again. Another deep breath and feel this breath, feel this energy just being pulled into your solar plexus. And exhale it out. Listen, listen to the words of today's affirmation. Every day, in every way, I'm freely opening my senses to the beauty in myself and opening up to the beauty around me and in all the people I will encounter. Take another deep breath. And exhale. Imagine all of your chakras activated. The bottom of the spine, imagine the color red, imagine the energy from the earth being drawn up into that chakra, grounding you, grounding your connection to the world, to the earth, and then see the energy move up higher from that chakra to the chakra above it, right at the belly button, around there, and see the color orange. This is the chakra that deals with the emotional body. And then the energy moves up higher to the solar plexus, just below the rib cage. Imagine the color yellow. This is the chakra of the intellectual body. And then bring the energy up higher to the heart space and see the color green. This is the chakra of the heart, the chakra of love. And then up there to the throat, imagine the color blue. This is our center of communication. And then the light moves up higher to the third eye, right between the two eyebrows. Imagine the color indigo. And imagine an eye right there that looking looks out into the world. Not just a metaphoric eye, but a real multi-dimensional eye. And then the energy moves up higher to the crown chakra. Imagine the color violet as the light pours through the chakra and falls down across the body and then imagine the light continuing on up into the cosmos bright white light connecting above now see at your heart an energy from the heart chakra and just below it the solar plexus see the energies moving back and forth in a figure eight like manner moving from one chakra to the next back and forth back and forth and as this does imagine the light expanding and filling your body and allow yourself to just be absorbed within the experience of the light And in the light, realize all the possibilities exist. And as we allow this light to be part of our experience, we realize that this light is the light of life. The light that exists for all. And therefore, we are the light. We are all individual aspects of the light and we are all the great collection of light. And as we shine bright the light within us, we feel good because we know that we are doing that which is our purpose. And as we shine this light this light goes and connects with others who are shining their light. And let's just imagine one by one by one, lights turning on around the planet. The light of life, the light of people waking up to their true spiritual destiny. And so as you feel this love and move through life, just allow yourself to shine 
as an example into the world. Shining light, radiating love, and allow that to be enough. And just let that energy go into the world and make the changes that it needs, that they need, that the great creator needs. So let the subconscious mind continue on that journey. The subconscious mind that's dealing with that Scorpio energy. Allow it to go into the darkness and to bring light to those emotions and to those feelings. And to let love shine in the world. So continue on that subconscious journey today. Over the course of this weekend, sending out love and light. And let's bring our conscious mind back to the present moment on the count of three. Three, coming back to the present moment filled with confidence. Two, coming back to the present moment filled with faith. And one, coming back to the present moment happy, healthy, and whole. Happy, healthy, and whole. Take another deep breath. Exhale. And open your eyes. All right, my friends, we've made it through the week. Thank you very much for being here. You know, I know there's a lot going on in the world. We're all aware of it. But I truly believe that as we turn our attention and we focus on the positive and we focus on the love and the light, that we create that to counteract all of the other stuff. And that's truly what I believe that we need to do to accentuate the positive and not worry about the negative just keep shining the light and shining the love there's more of us that know how to do this and when we do there's no stopping what we can do I'll be back on Monday you have a great weekend I'll talk to you soon much love and light to each and every one of you peace I'm out of here <laughs>